Hello. Oh, am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Giving me a microphone is very dangerous. Um, my name is Tanya Conrath, and I'm with Tech Growth Ohio, and I'm also um, a 93 graduate of Ohio University. And I'm pleased to be here tonight to introduce our guest speaker. Today, the reason we're gathered here is part of a worldwide celebration of Women in Entrepreneurship Day. People around the globe are having events just like this, and we're here to lift up, celebrate, highlight, and encourage women to think about starting their own ventures, being their own bosses. And because Renee's here, I'm going to say to pilot your own future. <laughs> Thanks for the laugh. Yeah. So tonight we gathered um, women leaders from across campus earlier, and we asked them, what change do you want to see in the world? And we had some very practical answers, like someone would like to have more horses um, in the world, <laughs> and other things like we need more women political leaders. We need people who care more about work, family balance, childcare issues. We need more peace around the globe. We need to look for ways to work together instead of against each other, and peace in general. So what majors do we have here tonight? Just shout out, what's your major? What else? Any entrepreneurship students? There's a, there are some. I see some going, huh, yeah, we're here. So part of the point of this is that entrepreneurship crosses all paths of life. Whatever major you're in, whatever department you're in. And as you consider your career path, I encourage you to remember that starting your own venture and your own enterprise is a very real option. And we have a speaker tonight that did just that. In 1988, Renee Bengelsdorf came to Ohio University to study journalism. She was a resident assistant, the founding vice president of Delta Zeta Sorority, and she also worked at The Post. During her sophomore year, she met Kurt. Kurt, where are you? I see you there in the back, who was also a bobcat, who would later become her future husband. In 2008, Renee and Kurt started Charlie Bravo Aviation. If you think of a real estate agent that matches buyers and sellers with houses, that's basically what Kurt and Renee do with airplanes, jet airplanes, fleets of planes, helicopters. So if any of you want to know the current market value of your helicopter, you're in luck. In 2015, the business aviation industry remains a man's world. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you look at the, who, hold who holds the title of director and hire, 96 positions, I'm sorry, 96% of those positions are held by men. Only 4% of women hold those higher up positions in aviation. Charlie Bravo Aviation has the distinction of being the first broker and dealer of aircraft to be certified as a woman-owned business. Renee acts as a spokesperson in press appearances all over the world on the topics of business aviation and women in aviation. She's an active member of the Women Presidents Organization, the International Aviation Women's Association, the National Business Aircraft Association, and the National Air Transportation Association President's Council. And Renee also gives back. She sits on the governing board of Phoenix Arising Aviation Academy. It's a group that teaches the love of STEM through aviation. She also serves on the advisory board of Sky Hope Network, which is a charitable organization that utilizes business aviation in times of natural disaster and crises. Renee is a living personification of an Amelia Earhart quote that goes, the woman who can create her own job is the woman who will win fame and fortune. As we celebrate Women in Entrepreneurship Day at Ohio University, I want you to look around at the network of support that you have right here. You already have a resource right here to build your connections and relationships with other strong women. Renee was quoted as saying, the most influential women in my life are those who know me best, who tell me to get out there because they see more in me than I see in myself, who don't let me off the hook in taking chances, and who selflessly cheer my successes. I try to do the same for them and for others. Tonight, Renee is here to inspire you to be your best. Please help me welcome Renee Bengelsdorf back to Ohio University. Thank you. That was very nice. 
Wow, I am so glad to be here. Am I going to give you feedback if I have this mic on also? It's off? Okay. I'm going to move it down. So it looks like a few of you are probably where I was when I was here in college, only I was here in the late 80s, and I can tell you for sure that everyone has better hair than I did when I was a student at Ohio <laughs> University. Despite the 1980s hair, I was, had a pretty bright future my junior year here at Ohio University. I turned 21 in January that year, which is somewhat important in the number one party school in the nation. Um, I was a resident assistant at Voight Hall. I was a senior writer for The Post. As Tanya mentioned, I was the founding vice president of my sorority. And I was a pretty good student at the number three rated journalism school in the nation. Like I said, my future was bright. Then on a cloudy April morning in 1991, I walked into that CVS on Court Street, looked around to see if there was anyone I knew, wiped my kind of sweaty hands on my sweatpants, and bought a home pregnancy test. And then I walked around the corner to the Wendy's, bath to the Wendy's and locked myself in a bathroom stall. <clears throat> the results were pretty clear. And suddenly, my future was not so clear. I got engaged that day to Kurt. <laughs> and seven months later, I was a college dropout, a very young wife, and a mom. By the time I was 25, I was a mother of two. We were living in Washington, DC, which is a town known for having overeducated workers, not undereducated ones. And I had no marketable job skills. I was a stay-at-home mom. My husband traveled for work, so even any thoughts that I had of freelance reporting were out. But it was in those days, between changing diapers and replaying The Lion King for the 72nd time, <clears throat> that I began to learn some principles that I believe crush mediocrity, and they ultimately put me where I am today. At 45, after years of alternating between being a stay-at-home mom and some really interesting vocations like writing about telephone bills and failing at starting an organic cookie dough company, I'm the CEO of a company that buys and sells private jets all over the world. Some of you mentioned that you'd like to travel. I, I've traveled the world. I've met amazing entrepreneurs, celebrities, and dignitaries. I've negotiated multi-million dollar deals on six different continents. I've worked with mining companies in Brazil and television empires in Mexico. I've worked with the Red Cross in South Africa. I've worked with some of the richest people in China. And some of you might be wearing something from one of my other clients, a Canadian clothing company that makes yoga pants that we're helping sell their plane right now. <laughs> but crushing mediocrity in business is not all glamorous. I've survived firing people even friends. I've recovered from a breach of contract that cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars of business. I've spent nights lying awake wondering how I was going to make payroll. I even survived a favorite employee suing us over a commission he didn't earn. But probably the most challenging thing that I've done is figure out how to work successfully with someone who feels like he has a license to sexually harass me. So we have been married for 25 years now. <laughs> you have to be careful of those MRS degrees, girls. You, sometimes you don't know what you're getting. I assume that some of you are here because you're business owners or aspiring entrepreneurs. Some of you may be here because you're interested in aviation. I, I met you earlier. You may be here as an assignment or a stopping point between two classes. But whatever the reason, I hope I somehow inspire you today that wherever you've come from, and wherever you're going, you can crush mediocrity and change the world. So what made the difference in my life? I made choices every day, just like you do. Some choices are big, and some are small. Sometimes I make good choices, and sometimes I make really bad ones. But the impact of your life is the sum of those choices, day after day, year after year. And the choices that seem the most devastating can be redeemed by the choices you make every day after those, that momentous one. That little boy who changed my future in 1991 graduated from TCU last year and married his college sweetheart last month 
uh, no baby on the way for him. <laughs> so what can you do today to ensure that you make the choices that turn your life into the version that changes your world? I'm gonna give you six principles that I've used to do that. Every single one of them, when put into practice, crushes mediocrity. The first of my life principles is be excellent. When you're excellent in the little things, you build the foundation to be excellent at the top. I thought I'd start with one of the littlest examples of this that we can all relate to in some way, Legos. Despite the variation in design and the purposes of individual pieces over the years, each Lego piece remains compatible in some way with existing pieces. Lego bricks from 1958 still interlock with those made in the current time. Per company manifesto, each Lego piece must be manufactured to an exacting degree of precision. The machines that manufacture Legos have tolerances as small as 10 micrometers. I had to look it up, I didn't know what that was. It's a one hundredth of a millimeter. So what's my point here? Attention to detail and willingness to excel in the small things all build the foundation for something great in the future. In February of this year, according to brand finance, Lego overtook Ferrari as the most powerful brand in the world. So how does that translate from the playroom to the boardroom. I believe it's a gradual change. In my 20s, I made beds with the sheet corners tucked in. I folded socks right side out. I taught my kids to do their homework the right way, even when their teachers didn't have the same standards. I wasn't being OCD. I was learning discipline and paying attention to details. In my 30s, I got the phone call I dreaded the most. My neighbor was the president of the PTA at my son's middle school. She was a really nice lady, don't get me wrong, but I had been avoiding her for weeks. I knew she wanted me on the PTA and I was having nothing to do with it. In my opinion, PTA was for drama moms, <clears throat> those moms who are the super moms on Adderall who were miserable at home and wanted to make everybody else in their life miserable. <laughs> no way. No way was I doing it. And that's exactly what I told her when she cornered me at the mailbox. <clears throat> she promised I would not have to come to meetings. She needed help with the school store. It was open one day a week, and it had lost money every year that it had been in existence. Okay, no meetings. I can do it. I think I can do it. So I went. I looked at the school store. I cast a new vision for the school store. And by paying attention to the little things, we turned that school store into an enterprise that made $10,000 for the school that year. It employed 25 parent volunteers and 45 student volunteers. They still have that store open every single day in that middle school. Today, running a company, I drive my employees a little bit crazy with deadlines and high standards and logo guidelines and sentence structure corrections. Thank you, Ohio University, for my excellent training in that. <clears throat> but they do appreciate my persistence and my demands. We just doubled last year's sales. Because we're excellent in little things, Charlie Bravo Aviation is regarded as the best marketed aircraft broker in the world. We are in the top 20, if not the top 10 companies of our type worldwide. And we're an eight-year-old company up against 30 and 40-year-old companies. Excellence in the little things enables you to build a foundation for excellence at the top. The second way we crush mediocrity is by doing the work. Whatever you're asked to do, do it to the best of your ability. Whether you're asked to do a little thing like empty the trash or organize a closet, or do something totally outside of your comfort zone, like take a job you don't know how to do, or giving a keynote speech at Women in Entrepreneurship Day, you, you figure it out and you get it done. This life principle is the one that helps you project confidence even when you're not feeling it inside. Kurt and I started uh, Charlie Bravo in 2008 together. Tanya mentioned that earlier. But we started as equal partners in the understanding that since it was a sales company and Kurt was a salesman, 
he would do most of the work. He negotiated the deals, he handled the contracts, did all of the prospecting, managed the sales team, and most importantly, made the money. I wrote the business plan, helped design the logo, I built a website, I wrote a few checks, I made copies, I answered the phones. In short, I did the work that needed to be done. Kurt's first deal at our company was selling a G3 to Lockheed Martin. I think they were turning it into some sort of a spy ship, and if I disappear tomorrow, you'll know I wasn't supposed to tell you that. After the deal was concluded, this guy said to us, you know, you should really be a woman-owned company. It's just, it's just a 1% change there, Kurt, and you know Renee's the boss anyway. So we went through the process of him signing 1% over to me so that it was 51% owned by me and 49% owned by him. But when we went to get our certification, we found out that it was not just a 1% deal. In order to be certified as a woman-owned company, you have to be a woman business enterprise. That meant that I had to have the highest title, I had to have the highest compensation, ultimately I had to have the most responsibility. <clears throat> Nobody could have firing authority over me, but I was all of a sudden able to fire him. <laughs> so I took the title, the CEO title, which was somewhat intimidating, and spent about three painful years growing into that role. I was doing the work. I was figuring it out. I asked questions. I sought mentors. I read books. I applied myself, and I did a lot of on-the-job training with high stakes. One of the most nerve-wracking lessons happened about this time five years ago. Some of you know that we came from Las Vegas yesterday. We were at a big aviation trade show. And just to set the stage a little bit, there are about 150 private jets on a tarmac. And around all of the private jets, there are red carpets and big, very elaborate tents and displays. And so Kurt and another uh, employee of ours and I went into the Gulfstream tent. And Gulfstreams are very prestigious private jets. And I had never been in it before, so I was really excited to be there. I was looking around. They had just signed Adam Scott as a client. Do you all know who he is? Very good looking Australian golfer. I thought maybe we'd bump into him. So I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. I got my plate of food. I sat down at the table. I took a big bite of my caprese salad, you know, the kind where you want the basil and the tomato and the mozzarella and your bites maybe just a tad too big. Bite just went in my mouth and this old man that we were sitting with looks at Kurt and says, I want her to sell my plane. Women have more of a conscience. My eyes, I'm sure, got huge. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I don't sell planes, I don't, I don't know how to do that. But all I could do was not. I mean, we needed, we wanted to do the sale. It's a $33 million plane. It would be the, the most expensive plane we had ever sold. So I agreed. Kurt, meanwhile, was, while we were putting this deal together, Kurt was on the other side of the country selling his own plane. So I was talking to, this man's name is Forrest, and Forrest was, I think, 78 years old when we were doing this deal. He had a ton of life experience. And one of those very bad life experiences apparently was with the company that we were selling the plane to. So he did not trust them at all. I remember him telling me one night, I'm not signing any contract that has more than seven lines. They can have seven lines. It's a Fortune 100 company. They have seven attorneys working on this contract. I'm going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I called the broker who I told this story to yesterday. I called him and said, I'm in trouble. I don't know what to say to this guy. And he goes, well, you need to figure it out. Get control of your client. And no sympathy. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. So I, I prayed. I did some homework on the IRS implications of, of doing only a seven line contract. I called him back the next day and I'm like, Forrest, you have to sign this. These are all the reasons. And he said, okay, okay, I'll sign it. So things were going along smoothly. We got through several more phases and he said, you know what? I don't wanna work with these people anymore. If they want my plane, they can, they can um, bring me $33 million in suitcases, in a suitcase and, uh, and I'll give them the keys. So my instant response was, okay, I've watched some mob movies. There's no way $33 million fits in one suitcase. This is going to be a truckload of suitcases, and we're going to have to have people with machine guns protecting this much money. And then what's the IRS going to think? So finally, we talked him into actually purchasing 
or selling the aircraft. He signed the contract. It was a very, very nerve wracking initiation into aircraft sales for me. Today, I handle all of the contracts for Charlie Bravo. I tell other brokers that they need to get their clients under control. and I usually am a little bit nicer about telling them how to do it. I love it. I love that part of my job now. But back then, I was terrified and vastly underqualified. And people tell me now that I seem very confident, and I think it's probably because I'm no longer afraid to take risks. I'm not afraid to fall on my face anymore. It's going to happen. What I'm more afraid of today than failing is being mediocre, because it really just doesn't get you anywhere. Once you get in and start doing the thing, whether it's small or huge, the confidence of knowing how to get back up and move on is invaluable. So the third way we crush mediocrity is by solving problems. Oh, there's the Gulf Stream. I forgot to advance my slide. I had a boss early on that taught me that I should not be a problem identifier. I should be a problem solver. About the third time that I went to him with a problem I was experiencing, he just stared me down. And I was like, oh yeah, problem solver, not a problem identifier. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, about a completely different topic here. How many of you know who Ronda Rousey is? Okay, good. For those of you who don't know, Rhonda has single-handedly revolutionized a male-dominated industry. Now, cage fighting might not be something that any of you aspire to do. I didn't hear any of that earlier when I was meeting with some of you. <clears throat> but before you throw it out, think about it from a different angle. Saturday night's UFC fight headliner was Rhonda's fight. And the fight right before hers was a woman's fight too. The warm-up fights were men's. That's a pretty big change. And Rhonda's big personality, charm, beauty, and of course her ability to finish fights in less than a minute with a technique called the arm bar, which dislocates the opponent's elbow, has made a big mark in fighting. There are hours and hours of video of Rhonda Rousey on YouTube. I'm gonna play a short clip just so that you have her dominance in mind when I go on to the rest of this point. She's the girl in the black. Words in trouble, there's no communication. And anyone can say what they want to say. It never gets better anyway. So why should I care about a bad reputation? Anyway, oh no. No, 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 no. Not me. Wow. No, 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 no. Not me. I don't give a damn about a bad reputation. Kind of get the point. If you're up, if you're facing Rhonda in a cage, that you've got some problems that you've got to overcome. <clears throat> she dominates you. She knocks you down. She flips you over. She puts you in an arm bar. You you don't get up. You usually leave bloody and stunned. These are definitely problems if you're against Rhonda Rousey in a fight. <clears throat> so now let's consider Saturday night's fight. Did anyone, did anyone here watch it besides me? Okay, a few of you are very timidly raising your hands, okay. <clears throat> Rhonda was favored 10 to one over Holly Holm, 10 to one. Those are some big odds. We just watched some of the problems that Holly knew that she was gonna face when she went up against Rhonda. They're pretty easy to identify and they terrify most people. Instead of focusing on how intimidating Rhonda is, Holly talked after the fight about focusing on the solutions. She trained like crazy, sometimes five workouts in a day. And what was no noticeably different in her fight Saturday night than any others is that Holly's a kickboxer and she learned to train, she trained to fight standing up. She didn't let Rhonda get her down often, I think maybe, what, three times? She got, anytime she got knocked down, she got right back up. She moved the fight to being on her terms, kickboxing. The blow that ended the fight was Holly's left foot 
connecting with the side of Rhonda's head. She knocked her out cold. Holly didn't just do her best to know the problems that she would face. She identified the solutions, trained to execute them, and beat the unbeatable in just under two rounds. I don't even think Rhonda had ever gone two rounds before. Most of our problems are not over in 10 minutes or less, but we can usually solve them if we're determined enough. Last year, we had a deal that went on for eight months. Deals usually close in about two to four weeks unless they're being exported to another country that, that tends to make it a little longer, but, but this was an unusually long deal. It was complicated from the very beginning because the buyer and the seller had a huge personality conflict. We were representing the seller and the buyer's broker and I were constantly refereeing. When it was time to close, the buyer sent $2.6 million to escrow, and then there was a problem with the title. The buyer agreed to wait for the seller to contact the state of Texas to have the problem cleared. Uh, the state refused. The seller decided to appeal. The buyer was furious. He was gonna lose his deposit if he took his money back out. I spent hours on the phone with attorneys. I called the state comptroller's office, I got rerouted to the attorney general's office. I thought I had hit a home run. I had flown the attorney general around in a helicopter and I was pretty sure he would work it out for me. Didn't work, the problem persisted. And the buyer kept his money in escrow, not willing to forfeit his deposit. It was a three month showdown with daily threats of lawsuits. Finally, we got the lien removed only to discover that the seller needed another tax shelter and his new planes delivery had been delayed again. Another complication. We persuaded the manufacturer to sign a demo over to him. Another solution. The reason this deal finally closed is because I learned to crush mediocrity early on by finding solutions instead of identifying problems. At the top, there are very few people you can call on to solve your problems. You have to figure it out. And believe me, you're more valuable as an employee and more respected as a business leader when you don't burden others with things you could solve on your own. Okay, we're at the halfway point. You guys getting anything out of this? Okay, good. So the fourth way we crush mediocrity is by sharing success. And Tanya, I think this has been your theme the whole night, so you're going to like this point. We all need other people, and besides, life is richer and more fun when you share experiences and successes. Two of my childhood friends were pretty good at this concept of being in the thick of things together. For those of you who don't know them, I'd like to introduce Ethel and Lucy. And hopefully we've got some sound on this one. Now this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her <laughs> so this is easier. Yeah, we can handle this, okay? Speed it up, 
there are few people in my life with whom I have this rich kind of cooperation. I'm gonna start with the most obvious example because he's here. <clears throat> my husband's been my partner in life, in raising kids, and for the last eight years in business. There are definitely pros and cons to being in business together, but for us, it has actually strengthened our relationship. We both have very strong personalities. We are both strong-willed, and we are both right almost all of the time. As I'm sure you can imagine, we've had some stressful times and some power struggles. But ultimately, we've learned to appreciate each other's weaknesses, each other's strengths, and make up for each other's weaknesses. Kurt has an amazing work ethic. He's the king of follow-up, and he's easily the best salesperson I've ever worked with. I am the detail person. I'm definitely more diplomatic. <laughs> I run the business, and I manage the team. We balance each other out. I've taken these lessons and learned to appreciate how Kurt's strengths make me a better person where they used to make me feel like I wasn't good enough. I still handle a sale of my own from time to time, but now I don't feel like I have to prove myself with that anymore. The same principles work with other relationships in my life, both personally and professionally. My friend Lisa was a fashion major and she now owns a car dealership. So it goes without saying that she's always well-dressed and larger than life. She's on the radio a lot doing, doing commercial spots. And every time I hear her voice in Pandora, on Pandora in the morning, my hands fly to my hair to check if it's big enough for Texas standards. And then I check to see if I've put my earrings on yet. She just invades my bathroom. Besides being a fashion diva, Lisa is the most outgoing person I know. She always makes everyone feel like a million bucks, and she sees the fabulous in everyone. She used to intimidate the living daylights out of me, but today she drags me out of my shell and makes me feel like I can really be that fabulous person she sees in me. I balance her out and calm her down when things seem crazy to her. The funny thing is, people think that we should hate each other, that we couldn't possibly share a stage and that we should be in competition with one another. That couldn't be farther than the truth for me and Lisa. What we think is that more people should be crushing mediocrity together, like we are, by sharpening each other and cooperating with one another. We promote each other and share successes, hers, mine, and the ones we're in together. There's a quote that I love by an English poet named, named Matthew Arnold who lived in the 1800s. He said, if there ever comes a time when the women of the world come together purely and simply for the benefit of mankind, it will be a force such as the world has never known. I've often wondered why women compete with one another instead of empowering one another. We're all guilty of it, even the nicest of us. Wouldn't it be a completely different place if we acted like lionesses rather than teenagers? Let's talk about this for a minute. The lion, the mighty king of the beasts, is always in competition with other lions. A younger male can challenge his authority and take over the pride. We saw that in the Lion King, right? With Mufasa and Scar and Simba. They walk around their territory and roar. But lionesses are very different. They cooperate instead of competing. They hunt and provide for the pride together. They take turns watching for predators. They raise their young together, even nursing each other's cubs. They even groom each other. If we shared our successes and really collaborated on the well-being of the world around us, I believe, like Matthew Arnold, that women could truly affect change in the world. Something to think about, crushing mediocrity by sharing. My fifth point tonight in how to crush mediocrity is about serving others through leadership. I didn't become CEO because I wanted a title. I didn't become the CEO because I wanted to be the face of the company. I didn't even become the CEO because I wanted to be the boss of my husband. I did it because it seemed to be the best way I could serve our business. I really had no idea how well equipped I would be to fill the role. Today, Kurt would tell you that because I'm the head and the face of the company and I handle the most difficult things, he is free to pursue the things he does best, like prospecting, 
and closing sales and golf. While Kurt's working on his PGA Tour hopes, I am determined to be the most effective leader I can be. As I've studied leadership styles, the one I like best and the one I most want to emulate is servant leadership. I think probably the best known author and speaker on the topic is John Maxwell. John says true leadership must be for the benefit of the followers, not to enrich the leader. I mentioned before that one of the things I did to grow was read a lot of books. One of my favorite authors of late is Simon Sinek. He really seems to delve to the heart of a matter and something in that really resonates with me. I have a video that's not gonna have any sound that I'm not gonna show you, <laughs> where he talks about where he came up with the name of the book. And Simon said that it was like a three month struggle with the publisher to come up with the name of the book. And he finally had a discussion with the publisher about this and, and they were talking about in the Marine Corps he asked the, the a Marine Corps general, why, is, why are the Marines so successful? What makes them such a great unit? And the officer said, leaders eat last. Officers eat last. And that's completely foreign to entrepreneurship usually. Usually entrepreneurs are told, go out, feed yourself first, pay yourself first. But to the contrary, I think that it's much better if you're looking out for others first. And he talks about in this, in this clip, he talks about a mom. A few years ago, there were some shootings in Kenya in a mall, and there was a picture that was, that was captured that was on the front page of the New York Times of a mother throwing herself over, over her child so that her child wouldn't be shot. And that's the epitome of a leader's eat last mentality. She is protecting her child. And now I've never had to, uh, I've never had to throw myself over someone to protect them from a bullet but I do uh, make hard decisions and I do stick by them. I fired a team member instead of assigning his work to someone else, I took it on myself because I wanted to show my employees that I was willing to do those excellent things and take on that extra burden to make the company successful. I've picked up the phone and called through 100 plane owners to find a plane for another client even though that is my least favorite thing to do. I did it because one of my employees had a deadline to meet and I was helping him out. I still answer the phone sometimes. I still make copies. There's no big moment in time when you become a servant leader. It's all in the little choices, day after day, year after year. Someone I've studied as an adult was an amazing servant leader. We all studied him in school as a civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Here's what another student of Dr. King had to say about the subject of servant leadership. A servant leader is one who offers an inclusive vision, listens carefully to others, persuades through reason, and heals division while building community. Dr. King's willingness to do these things and serve in this way changed not just his world, but its lasting effects have changed ours. We have the same opportunities to lead through example in a selfless way and change the world. Consider this quote from an inspirational speaker I found on the internet. We've heard it a hundred different ways, but this version was particularly poignant for me. I don't want my life to be defined by what's etched on my tombstone, or the degree that's on my wall, or what's in my autobiography. I want it to be defined by what is etched in the lives and hearts of those I touched. It's about the people at the bottom of it all. So I want to challenge you to be a, a real leader. Simon talked about that. Eat last, crush mediocrity, and change the world. In complete contradiction to my journalism training here, I've saved the best point for last. I think the key to crushing mediocrity is in finding and executing your underlying purpose. As much as I love my job, my purpose in life is not selling private jets. That's not even my passion. And I am not likely to change the world just by selling private jets to rich people. No matter how much you love what you do or what you plan to do, your job will not likely be the driver for you to change the world. This is tough. Your generation, most of you in here are students, your generation, much more than mine, really wants to be more purposeful about life. You want to know 
and understand and believe in the meaning behind what you do, everything you do. You don't just want to have a job where you like your coworkers and you kind of like what you do and you get paid a lot more money than you did when you were waitressing in college and you don't necessarily care about the great benefits. You want to be fulfilling an underlying purpose. I think there's a big disconnect between what your expectations are and what employees have to offer and it's causing a huge amount of job turnover among millennials. You want meaning and significance, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a fantastic sentiment. But as employers, we don't necessarily know how to give you that. I believe that if each one of you can figure out what your underlying purpose is in life, you can find that significance on your own. You can change the world from whatever job pays your bill because your purpose comes from within you not from the job title or the degree that you have. I am telling you tonight that you don't have to jump from job to job trying to find one that fulfills you. You can find a job or start a company that enables you to do what really drives you. But first, you have to figure out what that driver or underlying purpose is. I'm gonna give you a few examples and then try to unpack that for you because it's the most complex and the most important thing I'm telling you tonight. Finding this purpose is the key to becoming a world changer. I had a milestone birthday earlier this year, and I've been doing some pretty deep soul searching on the subject of purpose in my life. I think I've hit on something. It started when I was in a seminar, and the instructor asked us what our character strengths were. Then she asked the other people in this small group. They saw, in things, they saw things in me that I really hadn't identified about myself. Then she asked us to ask others close to us what they saw. I asked. I even asked my sister who's sitting here in the front row. What I heard was that I'm bold, detail-oriented, honest, discerning, a good manager, and diplomatic. My husband told me that I was a problem solver. My daughter-in-law said that I don't let conflict simmer. I get it on the table and deal with it. As I was thinking about those things, I looked at what I'm really passionate about in life and work. Performing to the best of my ability, having harmony, making others better by being around me, and learning new things were just a few. For example, I'm thrilled as a parent when my kids are successful in the things that are most meaningful to them. I'm most satisfied in my marriage when Kurt and I are in agreement on most things. I feel empowered at work when things are running healthily. One of the things that attracted me to journalism in the first place is that I got to investigate something different every day. The thing I enjoy about selling planes is that I have new challenges every day. After I chewed on these answers for a while and compared them to my character strengths, I saw a common theme. I am most fulfilled when I am coming up with creative solutions to problems. That is my underlying purpose. I can do that in my job, in my relationships, in the charities that I serve, in the way that I communicate. My best friend's purpose is empowering women. She's a car dealer. In fact, she's the number one Fiat dealer in the nation. But her purpose is not selling Fiats. It's about helping women feel valued in the car buying process. It's about hiring women and teaching them sales skills. It's about chairing the American Heart Association initiative to educate women about the risks of heart disease. It's about raising a quarter of a million dollars for Girl Scout STEM learning. My son's purpose is also different from mine. He's passionate about any number of things, college football, working out, his new wife, homeless ministry, and winning. But when we dug deeper and looked at his skills and his strengths, the ability to relate to people with whom he disagrees, a great sense of humor, a strong sense of justice, and natural leadership, whether he wants it or not, we see that Jake's underlying passion is about building relationships. Jake also happens to be a millennial who works for me. When I know that his underlying purpose, and frankly, his biggest strength, is building relationships, I understand why he doesn't enjoy the parts of his job that require him to analyze data. He lives for the personal and professional relationships that he builds, whether he's building those for himself 
or he's building those between two other people. He's best at his job when he can really do that. So we work, Jake and I together, work to find the balance between the things that he has to do, like analyzing data, and the things he loves to do, like building relationships. From these examples, I hope you can see your purpose, the thing that really makes you tick at the bottom of it all, is not the same as your degree or any title you may carry, whether it's sister, director, doctor, boss, mom, or 10-year-old birthday girl in the front row. <laughs> It's about what gets you up each morning and motivates you throughout the day. I'd like to challenge you to go through the following exercise. If you don't have a notepad, now's a great time to pull out your cell phone and take a picture of the, the next couple of screens because I'd love for each one of you to do this. And there'll be three up here if you only want to take one picture, that's fine. Think about your character strengths, then ask others what they see in you and write these things down. It's important to ask other people because they see things that you don't. Then I'd like you to identify the things you really love to do and analyze what it is that you love about them in your job, in your degree, in your extracurricular activities, in your, in your relationships. If you look at both lists, do you see an underlying theme? If not, you may need to dig deeper. The reason Jake is passionate about college football is that it connects him with other people. He played football. He was a quarterback. He can talk about football intelligently. He can share an afternoon with someone building a relationship watching a football game. It's about the relationships more than the scores for him. This is not a five minute process for most of us. It requires some soul searching and some analytical thinking. But when you stumble upon that theme, you likely have found your underlying purpose. And then you can begin making choices based on that. Those choices can help you change the world. Can I tell you that I changed the world selling private jets? Nope. But when I'm selling a solution to a problem of traveling between small towns, Critical organ transplants can happen. Face-to-face -face meetings can save jobs or deals. And by having that extra income and some business sense, I can fund projects to free girls from sex trafficking and help them get back on their feet. When I am operating in my underlying purpose, I am crushing mediocrity and I am changing my world. And when each one of you finds and operates in your underlying purpose, when you are leading from a position of serving, when you are sharing successes and helping others succeed, when you are solving problems instead of just identifying them, when you are doing the work, whether it is menial or outside of your comfort zone, and when you are excellent in the little things, each one of you is crushing mediocrity and you will change the world. Thank you. Broke your mic. I think we have some time for a few questions. Sure. Are you willing to answer a few questions? So, any questions? What's the most challenging thing you've dealt with in Yeah, what's the most challenging thing I've dealt with in the workforce? Wow, I thought you were going to send me a softball. That was, that's tough. I think the most challenging thing that I've dealt with is, um, is believing in myself. Um, it's something I came into a job that I didn't know how to do and I had to learn to do it. And while my um, personality and even really the stuff that I had learned up to that point equipped me to do it, I didn't see that in myself. So, so believing in myself has probably been my biggest challenge overall. Any other tough questions? One of those things I told you tonight 
which is that the impact of your life is the sum of all of your choices, day after day and year after year. So each little choice that you make builds a foundation for where you're going in the future. Um, and so sometimes you have to look, at, look back at the choices that you made and say, you know what, I can turn that bad choice into something good. Or you can say, um, I need to never make that bad choice again. And so there's some, there some things that you can look back and do. But if you decide to go down a good path, being excellent in little things, being honest even when it's difficult, those kinds of things that build your integrity really build a great foundation. Those things are important, even when they don't seem like they are. Anybody else? Yes. Um, work harder than them, read more books, learn more, and look great. I, it's all important. It's all important. You have to be smarter and better looking. Um, did I, could everyone hear that question? Okay. So one of the things that we can do to advocate STEM um, or aviation, I, th I think both are, are very important from an early age, is, is getting involved in the community. And that's one of the, one of the things that I do. I think it's... Um, it's really important to give back to your community, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons that I'm here tonight. So I think that it's important to help um, people find their underlying passion and see the different kinds of things that you could do with that to to come up with a great um, career future, whether that's in in science or technology or aviation or engineering. Anything else? This is, a, this is a question I actually get asked a lot. I think that, that work-life balance and finding that perfect balance is an absolute myth. Um, it's kind of like a merry-go-round or a teeter-totter. You, you just try not to fall off. Um, one of the ways that I've balanced my family and my work life is by involving my kids in, in our business. So a few years ago, we did uh, a lot of helicopter shuttle for the Formula One race in Austin. And both of our kids, who were probably 16 and 20 at the time, got involved and did some customer service stuff during that. Um, we talked about deals and, and struggles with our kids and involved them in our business um, from the time that, that we started it. And so it was very interesting to me when my son was um, getting his, his degree in communications with a minor in business, he, sent, he interviewed for probably 30 different jobs, and he, he came to us one day and said, wow, you know, I haven't found anything that's as interesting as what you do. So I think it's really important to share, um, again, with the younger generation what you do and what you're about and why you make the decisions that you make and expose people to, to what you do, and that's what we did um, with our kids. Although my daughter, um, who's um, kind of precocious, would sit at the kitchen table and turn the timer on on her iPhone every time Kurt and I would start talking about business at dinner, and she would tell us, give us a grade at the end of dinner, and um, some nights we failed. <laughs> True. Anything else? <laughs> 